Hello, good morning. My name is Juan Galvez. I'm a pulmonary critical care fellow at the University of Louisville, and we're going to talk about ARDS and salvage therapies. So the objective of this lecture are history, definition, and epidemiology of ARDS, diagnosis, usual therapy, recruitment maneuvers, unconventional ventilator strategies, rescue therapies, and ECMO. So the first description of ARDS was probably belongs to Lenek, who defined idiopathic pulmonary edema in 1821. So this is a picture of Lenek. Uh, he also invented the first stethoscope because he was not feeling comfortable. And I agree, listening to the chest directly. So the first case or cases series or the first description of ARDS was done by Dr. Ashbaugh from Ohio State and Thomas Petty or Tom Petty and Dr. Levine Lancet in 1967. The respiratory stress syndrome in 12 patients who manifested with acute onset of tachypnea hypoxia and loss of compliance after a variety of stimuli or syndrome did not respond to a usual or ordinary method of respiratory therapy. Um, this is a picture of Dr. Ashbaugh on the right and on the left, Dr. Um, Tom Petty. So the definition in 1994 was the first definition, but the current definition is the 2012, the Berlin definition that was published in JAMA in 2012, and it's based in four bases or pillars. That is timing, imaging, origin of pulmonary edema and oxygenation. And this is the table. The timing is within one week of known clinical insult or new worsening of respiratory symptoms. The chest imaging bilateral opacity is not fully explained by effusions, lower lung collapse or nodules, the origin of the edema, respiratory uh, failure not fully explained by cardiac failure or fluid overload, and it needs to be excluded, any other causes of it with an echocardiogram, and oxygenation, and then they qualify as mild, moderate, and severe, mild from less and less or 300 milligrams of 300 millimeters of mercury with a PEEP of 5 to 200 and moderate 200 to 100 with a PEEP of 5 and or more or severe less than 100 with a PEEP of 5. So the epidemiology of ARDS is estimated that 10% of all ICU admissions will be ARDS and 23% of the mechanical ventilated patients in the ICU are ARDS. So in one in four, uh, from four patients in the vent, one potentially could be ARDS statistically. So in further analysis by continents, the incidence of ARDS is highest in Oceania um, with 0.5 cases ICU per year, followed by Europe, North America, Africa, South America, and Asia, when the cases is 0.27 cases for ICU bed year. The diagnosis. So diagnosis is very important. It's identify the patients that has risk factors for develop ARDS for with unexplained pulmonary edema, obtain an HIP, HMP, cardiac history, infectious causes, rule out ARDS mimics, obtain BMP, CBC, ABG, chest x-ray, and you can confirm cardiac function with an echo. Depends how savvy is the intensivist and cardiac echo, like oh, done by tech or bedside echo. ARDS risk factors are pneumonia, aspiration of gastric contents that can cause aspiration pneumonia, um, pulmonary contusion, inhalation injury, near drowning. Indirect risk factors are sepsis of non pulmonary source, source non thoracic trauma, or hemorrhagic shock pancreatitis, major burn injury, drug overdose, transfusion of blood products, cardiopulmonary bypass, reperfusion edema after lung transplantation or embolectomy. So the ARDS mimics are very important because like some cases could not be or could be ARDS. So it, uh, the most common is congestive heart failure and then it's interstitial lung diseases and all the other causes, connective tissue disease like polymyositis, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, or good, or good pastor syndrome, um, drug-induced lung disease, cancer, B-cell lymphoma or metastatic adenocarcinoma, drug-induced lung disease, 
and in the bronchial tuberculosis. So there are two x-rays, uh, bilateral opacities present in both. Uh, one patient is intubated, the other one, which one is ARDS? And this is acute eosinophilic pneumonia that can mimic ARDS, usually presents in young patients that start either smoking or new job. They present like a fulminant acute respiratory failure that reverses with the steroids. And the diagnosis is with a bronchovular lavage with eosinophilia in the bronchovular lavage. And then the second one, this is ARDS. So it's really hard to distinguish between both. So ARDS treatment and the evidence. We're going to base the lecture just on the evidence that we have for treatment. And we're going to review all these studies of these fluid balance, ventilator strategies, alternative modes, or tools of ventilation in ARDS, rescue therapies, uh, inhaled vasodilators, and ECMO. So fluid balance in AR and ARDS. So the comparison of two fluid management strategies in acute lung injury. This is the it's a famous trial, the FACT trial. It was published in the New England Journal 2006, if I'm correct. So it's a randomized study, multicenter compared liberal strategy versus conservative fluid strategy in 1,000 patients. The primary outcome of at mortality was mortality at, seven, at 60 days, and the secondary outcomes were ventilator free days, organ failure free days. So the study showed that the conservative strategy have more ventilator free days at 28 days with a p-value then ICU free days, more ICU free days in the conservative strategy. So they left the ICU early. And sorry. And then the rest, there was no other significance, statistical significance. Uh, mortality was not changing mortality. No difference in mortality, conservative fluid strategy improved lung function and shortened the duration of the ICU, duration of, uh, pardon me, of mechanical ventilation and also ICU days, this result in support of conservative fluids. Then Dr. Semler published this nice paper in the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And the impact of initial central venous pressure on outcomes of conservative, conservative versus liberal fluid management in acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this was a retrospective analysis of the fluid and the catheter treatment trial a multicenter randomized trial comparing conservative with liberal fluid management in acute respiratory distress syndrome. syndrome. Multicenter 609 individuals. And the first table on the left, it shows that the conservative has lower mortality with a CVP 0 to 8. And there's even a table that said like how to titrate the fluids and that. So this study came that central venous pressure of 8 or less experienced lower mortality with a conservative strategy, 17 to 36 percent, with a P of 0 0.05. Conservative fluid management decreased mortality for acute respiratory distress syndromes, syndrome. Patients with a low initial central venous pressure in this population, the administration of IV fluid seems to increase the mortality. So now we have ventilator strategies, and then we pass from the first picture. We have somebody assisting, probably a tidal volume and an endotracheal tube. And then we have the order, like resuscitation, and then finally the ventilator. Ventilator strategies. The most important thing is like, I'm going to quote Plato. We can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when a man are afraid of the light, Plato. This was the first paper published in the New England Journal. Prior to this paper, there were other papers showing the, con the conservative or protective ventilator strategies. But this was published, I think, in 1998 in the New England Journal. And it was a Brazilian paper by Dr. Marcelo Brito Paso Samato. And all the effects of a protective ventilation strategy on mortality in the acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
So he randomized 53 patients with early acute respiratory distress syndrome. Conventional, conventional ventilation was based on the strategy of maintaining the lowest PEEP for the acceptable oxygenation with a tidal volume of 12. Protective ventilation involved PEEP above the lower inflection point of the static pressure volume curve of tidal volume of 6 cc per kilo driving pressure less than 20 cc uh, centimeter of water above a peep, a peep value permiss and permissive hypercarbia. So he had the kind of like the whole package, the first one in 1998, that was 20 years ago. And as compared with conventional ventilation, the protective strategy was associated with improved survival at 28 days, a higher rate of winning from mechanical ventilation, and a lower rate of viral trauma in patients with acute respiratory stress syndrome. And we can see with the mouse how the survival was way better with a significant P than conventional ventilation. The study was small. So then the New England Journal, they re this is the ARMA study, they re repeated and they call it ventilation with lower tidal volumes as compared with traditional tidal volume for acute lung injury uh, and the acute respiratory distress syndrome. That was in the year 2000, 18 years ago. Uh, so multicenter randomized trial, tidal volume of 12 cc per kilo of predicted ideal body weight with a plat plateau pressure of 50 versus the 6 cc and the plateau pressure of 30. The first primary outcome was dead before the patient was discharged home and was breathing without assistance. The secondary outcome was the number of days the second primary outcome, sorry, was the number of days without ventilator use from day one to day 28. So we can see here in this table the dead before discharge home and breathing without assistance in the lower tidal volume was 31 and in the traditional was 39, the p-value was 0 0.07. The breathing without assistance, it was 65, uh, 28 days, sorry. 65% in, in the lower tidal volume and 55 in the traditional with a p-value that 0 0.001 or less. And the number of days of ventilator-free days were more ventilator-free days in the lower tidal volume than in the, in the higher tidal volume with a p-value p of 0 0.07. So in patients with acute lung injury, that was the old definition from 1994, and the acute respiratory distress syndrome, Mechanical ventilation with lower tidal volume than is traditionally used results in decreased mortality and increase the number of days without ventilator use. Then we fl go to 2004 and we have higher versus lower PEEP in patients with ARDS. 549 patients with acute lung injury and ARDS to receive mechanical ventilation with either low or higher PEEP. Clinical outcomes were similar whether lower or higher PEEP levels are used. Then we go to 2015. Driving pressure and survival in acute respiratory distress syndrome. Dr. Amaro again and Dr. Brower and all Daniel Talmor, very big names of critical care medicine. Dr. Mercato in this, on Solotsky, in this big, big pa pa paper, all the names of the main authors. Then driving pressure and survival in the acute respiratory distress syndrome. This was a multi-level mediation analysis to analyze the individual data from 3,562 patients with ARDS. Enrolling nine previously reported randomized trials, they examined the driving pressure as an independent variable associated with survival. So this is the main graph. So they found that the driving pressure has lower the driving pressure better the survival not necessarily but they found the relative risk and i will go so they 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 confirmed that the driving pressure of 15 is the best point to get like multi-variable relative risk of death in the hospital so among the ventilation variables driving pressure was the most strongly associated with survival and one standard deviation increment in the driving pressure Approximately seven centimeters of water was associated with increased mortality. Driving pressure was the ventilation variable that best stratified the risk. The decrease in driving pressure owing to the changes in ventilator settings were strongly associated with increased survival. 
So that's why it's so important that we have to look in all our ventilated patients with ARDS driving pressures. Then we have another trial that Dr. Cavalcanti is from last year, I think. Uh, the effect of long recruitment and titrated positive and expiratory pressure PEEP versus low PEEP on mortality in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. And prior to that, we used to do recruitment maneuvers. And I remember being a first year fellow and my attending told me, go do a recruitment maneuver. And I found it really, really stressful. So this was like multi-center randomized trial conducted at 120 intensive care units, an experimental strategy with long recruitment maneuver and PEEP titration according to the best respiratory system compliance with an universe of like 101 in the experimental group or a control strategy with low PEEP with a universe of 509 uh, individuals or patients. The primary outcome was all cause mortality until 28 days. The secondary outcomes were the length of stay in the ICU and hospital state ventilator free days through day 28, pneumothorax requiring like chest tube within seven days, viral trauma within seven days, the ICU in hospital and six month mortality. So this is the table that talks by their own. The re long recruitment and titrated PEEP has higher mortality than the low PEEP. In patients with moderate to severe RDS, a strategy with long recruitment and titrated PEEP compared with lower PEEP increased the 28-day all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality was also higher within six months in the experimental than in the control group. No difference in the secondary outcomes. So ARDS ventilator, to summarize all this. This is from like a really good book of mechanical ventilation, The Essentials of Mechanical Ventilation, from page 181 to 191, one of my favorite books of mechanical ventilation. Uh, mode, AC mode, control mode, with a rate of 20 to 35 to avoid idle peep. And you can do the maneuvers and take into account if the patient is a smoker or have any other conditions that can cause idle peep, COPD. Tidal volume four to six. This can cause ventilator synchronous, but we try to aim for six with a plateau pressure of 28, a driving pressure less than 15, and inspiratory time 0 0.5 to 0 0.8, PEEP of eight to 20, the lowest to achieve like the op optimal uh, saturation of oxygen and FiO2 as needed to achieve 88 to 92 percent with a PaO2 of 55 to 80 millimeters of mercury. And this is the two tables that they are in the ARDS net, they are online, about the higher PEEP, lower FiO2, lower PEEP, higher FiO2. You have to take in consideration also that the oxygen is toxic up to central level, I think 60%, but still, you know, this is the two tables that you can keep handed, keep it in the ICU rooms. I recommend to do that. So then we have the alternative modes or tools of ventilation in the RDS. So we have the airway pressure release ventilation or APRB mode, high frequency oscillation ventilation or HFOB, and we have esophageal balloons. So APRB is widely used as a rescue therapy in ARDS, although it's used not supported by randomized clinical trials. I couldn't find any evidence about this, it was very limited. And this is a high frequency oscillation. Uh, when I started my residency, I saw a patient in the surgical ICU on this and it really caught my attention. So I guess Thank that you for, for the this video featuring settings on initiated uninitiated critical care dogs, probably like the new fellows haven't seen one of these. So that's why I put it. Um, this video is from YouTube and I'm going to pause it and move it forward when we can see how they operate the ventilator machine. So I was walking to the ICU where I was doing my residency and I heard this and I was like puzzled. So. So then increase it back to six hertz and see the volume. So if you guys can see this more in I you can go to YouTube and see your on your own. 
So this brings us to the next study. It's called the oscillate study. It's the high frequency oscillation in early acute ARDS. February 2018, 2013, pardon me, was a multicenter randomized control trial conducted in 39 ICUs in five different countries, randomly assigned adults with new onset of moderate to severe ARDS to HFOB, targeting lung recruitment or to control ventilation strategy targeting lung recruitment with the use of low tidal volumes and high positive and expiratory pressure. So this is the table. This is the control is in blue and the HFOB is in red. And they concluded that in adults with moderate to severe RDS, early application of HFOB as compared with a ventilation strategy of low tidal volume and high positive and expiratory pressure does not reduce and it may increase in hospital mortality. So I think after this, it fell off the use of this completely off, like slowly, I haven't seen it used. So then it's a fagio balloon. So this a fagio balloon is a device that you introduce in the patient esophagus, obviously, and you measure the transpulmonary pressure. So esophageal pressure is estimate of the plural pressures. And as compared with the cur current standard of care, a ventilator strategy using esophageal pressure to estimate the transpulmonary pressure significantly improve oxygenation and compliance. A multicenter trial, I took this from the from the New England Journal. A multicenter clinical trials are needed to determine whether this approach should be widely adopted. So transpulmonary pressure equals airway pressure minus plural pressure that you measure with the balloon. There was the EP event one that showed like positive results, but it was a small study. So then they repeated the EP, EP event two. That this is a study came out in JAMA this year, and it's the effect of titrating positive and expiratory pressure PEEP with an esophageal pressure guided strategy versus empirical high PEEP FIO2 strategy on death and they free from mechanical ventilation among patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. So a randomized clinical trial conducted in 14 hospitals in North America, 200 mechanical ventilated patients age 16 and older with moderate to severe RDS with a PAO to FIO2 ratio of 200. Participants were randomized to PES guided, esophageal balloon guided PEEP or empirical high PEEP. So this is the curve of the results. The balloon guided is the yellow and the empirical is the blue. And they found the following. Among patients with moderate to severe RDS, balloon guided PEEP compared with empirical high PEEP FIO2 resulted in no significant difference in death and days free from mechanical ventilation. These findings do not support the use of esophageal balloon guided in the PEEP titration in the RDS. My comment and my take from this study is like there are there's still room for use of this in certain kind of patients, especially in the obese population. The US I think ranging thirty four percent of obese or thirty percent of obese population and sixty nine percent is overweight. So I think like there is room to use on these special populations. I think the esophageal balloon still has a useful tool when it's needed, but not in all the patients. So then we have rescue therapies. Rescue therapies for ARDS, we have the, we're going to start with neuromuscular blockers. And this is like a curiosity study by Dr. Papasian, France. Neuromuscular blockers in early acute respiratory distress syndrome. So multicenter, double blind, 340 patients with onset of severe ARDS. 178 patients were assigned to receive cisastacuronium and the rest placebo. So 162. Severe RDS defined by PO2 FIO2 ratio less less than 150, PEEP more than 5, with 6 to 8 of tidal volume. The primary outcome was the 90 day hospital mortality, and they found the following. They found at 28 days, the, pa the patients with disease acronym has significant st statistical value, increase of survival. They also found that from day one, 
they have m more free ventilator days significant and they also found less barotrauma and also they found also free ventilator days at 90 days and numbers of days outside the ICU after 90 days were also significant so this is the table this is the coronium survival versus placebo so improve the adjusted 90 day survival rate increase the numbers days of ventilator free days and days outside the ICU and the decreased incidence of barotrauma during the first 90 days so neuromuscular blockers consider other efforts to reduce patient ventilator asynchrony before considering paralysis limit the duration of the neuromuscular blockade should not should have little need beyond 48 hours avoid administration of corticosteroids with steroid, steroidal neuromuscular blocker agents like example becuronium or parcuronium to trade the dose according to physical science and routine peripheral neuromuscular money the next one saying la well, salvage is prone position so there's several ways to do proning um, here we have like the rotoprone bed I have been exposed to that bed uh, in my practice and there also there is like in the New England Journal there is a video how to prone without a, a bed so prone position can improve pulmonary gas exchange by diverting the blood away from the poorly aerated lung regions in the posterior thorax and increasing the blood flow in the aerated lung regions in the anterior thorax so prone position in severe acute respiratory distress syndrome this was Claude Geron in the Proserva study group. Multicenter prospective randomized control trial. 466 patients with severe RDS were randomized either assigned to prone for 16 hours or be left in supine position. Severe RDS was defined a PO2 FiO2 ratio of 150, FiO2 more than 60, PIP of 5, and tiger volume of 6. Primary outcome was 28-day mortality after inclusion, the rate of successful extubation, ICU length of stay, tracheostomy rate, and complications. And then we have uh, the prone group has better survival in decreased mortality with significant p-values and 90 days and 28 days. They also have successful, more successful extubation and ventilator-free days. And we can see the curve here in the prone group, the survival, cumulative probability of survival compared to the supine group. So the length of stay, the incidence of pneumothorax rate or use of non-invasive mechanical ventilation of the extubation and tracheostomy did not differ. Higher rates of extubation in the prone group and in patients with severe RDS, early application of prolonged prone position in session significantly decreased the 28 and 90 day mortality. So after that, Dr. Garan and the ESICM trial group from the French Society of Reanimation and Anesthesia uh, came with a prospective international observational prevalence study of on prone positioning of ARDS patients, the APRONET, ARDS Prone Position Network. So the study aimed to determine the prevalence of use of prone position in ARDS patients. That was the primary endpoint, the physiological effects of prone position and the reasons for not using it. The prospective international prevalence study found that prone position was used in 32.9% of patients with severe RDS and was associated with low complication rates, significant increase in oxygenation and significant decrease of driving pressure. Severe RDS Proserva defined and this is like an statement that said like in that paper said that we are not using as much prone that we should use so when to use and what are the indications of proning and contraindications so Proserva defined ARDS in the study ARDS as those having partial pressure of oxygen fraction of impaired oxygen PO2 FiO2 ratio of less than 150 FiO2 more than 0.6 and a PEEP of more than 5. Refractory hypoxemia due to ARDS, an alternative regional definition, it will be like PaO2, FiO2 or less than 100 unequal, a PO2, less, a PO2 arterial of less than 60, 
despite the optimization of ventilator settings. So these patients should you consider proning if there are no contraindications. So we have the contraindication for proning is the persistent shock with a map of less than 65. Uh, acute bleeding, multiple fractures of trauma, spinal instability, pregnancy, raised intracranial pressure less than more than 30 millimeters per mercury or cerebral perfusion pressure of less than 60, tracheal surgery or sternotomy within two weeks, nerve compression or crush injury, venous stasis or dislodging of the, and these are the complications, nerve compression and crush injury, venous stasis and dislodging of the endotracheal tube, diaphragm limitation, pressure sores, the catheters can come out, the tubes can come out, retinal damage, transient reduction of arterial oxygen saturation, vomiting, and transient arrhythmias. When I have prone patients, I have seen most of this, and it could be very stressful for the, for the whole ICU team. Then the next is inhaled vasodilators. We have Bellitri there, nothing, the pump of inhaled nitric oxide, and the mechanism of action. So, laboratory research has, sh has shown that hypoxia-induced vasoconstriction leads to pulmonary hypertension. Selective vasodilation of vessels perfusing the aerated lung tissue would distribute the blood from poorly ventilated regions, reducing the shunt fraction, and at the same time correcting the pulmonary hypertension. So, nitric oxide. This is a meta-analysis, a Cochrane review, actually, that analyzed inhaled nit nitric oxide in, uh, in RDS in children and adults, and they took 14 RT RCTs with a total of 1,303 patients. 10 of these trials had high risk of bias. I know inhaled nitric oxide showed no statistically significant effect on overall mortality. The evidence is insufficient to support INO in any category of critical ill patients with acute hypoxic respiratory failure. Inhaled nitric oxide results in tracing improvement of oxygenation, but do not reduce mortality and may be harmful, and it seems to increase renal impairment. So you're basically not just improving the numbers. Inhaled prostacyclines in the literature evaluating a role from inhaled prosta prostaglandins, prostacyclines. In the management of patients with ARDS is limited. Several studies had shown improved of oxygenation but not impacting mortality. Then we have ECMO. So we have a BA ECMO and BV ECMO. We they use more and the patients are in use of ECMO, VA ECMO for respiratory support. So a little bit of history of ECMO. Uh, in 1929 in Russia the first extracorporeal perfusion was done in a dog, and it doesn't surprise me. The dog sent in 57, no, 58 Leica to the space, so it doesn't uh, surprise me that they did in a dog in, in the 20s. In 1953, uh, Gibbons performs the first extracorporeal bypass. And in 1976, Bartlett reports the successful use of ECMO in a newborn Esperanza that she did she survive. L in 1989, ELSO was created. In 19, 2009, the AH1N1 flu pandemic started, the swine flu. Uh, remember those days. And then CSAR trial was published in Lancet in the same year. And EOLIA, EOLIA trial was published in the England Journal last year. So, depending on the patient needs, partial to complete cardiopulmonary support, pino arterial VA ECMO, or partial to complete pulmonary support, VV ECMO can be achieved. In typical circuit, venous blood is drained out of a major vein, passed through a pump and a membrane lung for gas exchange and oxygenated blood is then returned to a major artery, VA ECMO, or a vein, VV ECMO. Guidelines that describe the indications and practice of ECMO are published by the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, or ELSO, founded in 1989. Hypoxic respiratory failure with a ratio of PO to FiO2 ratio of like less than 100, despite of optimization of ventilator settings, you should consider ECMO. 
Berlin consensus documented on acute respiratory distress syndrome ARDS suggests an ECMO suggests ECMO in patients with severe respiratory failure with a PO2 FiO2 less than 70, hypercarbia respiratory failure with an arterial pH less than 7.20. Ventilatory support as a bridge to lung transplantation, cardiac circulatory failure, refractory cardiogenic shock, massive pulmonary embolism, cardiac arrest, failure to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass after cardiac surgery, pardon me, as a bridge to either cardiac or lung transplantation or placement of a ventricular assist device. Contraindications for ECMO. The only absolute contraindication to ECMO is the pre-existing conditions which is incompatible with recovery, severe neurologic injury, and stage malignancy. Relative contraindications include uncontrolled bleeding and very poor prognosis from the primary condition, and result, results in respiratory failure are better in ECMO if it's instituted within seven days of intubation. Complications, bleeding, systemic thromboembolism, neurologic injury, cannula-related, heat, pulmonary hemorrhage, cardiac thrombosis, coron coronary or cerebral hypoxia, and neurologic injury. The last four are more common in VA ECMO, but still can happen in VV ECMO. Bleeding is very big in ECMO, happens like for what I read in the literature, 30 to 50% of the cases. This is something that we always have to keep in mind when you have patient in ECMO. So the CSAR trial. So the efficacy and economic assessment of a conventional ventilator support versus extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for severe adult respiratory failure CSAR trial was done in the UK and there's like two pictures of CSAR and in Spanish is how you write Caesar, the Roman Emperor. So it's a UK based multi center trial. They said they use, but we use independent central randomization, 180 adults in a ratio of one to one to receive continu continued conventional management or referral to consideration for treatment by ECMO. So ECMO, 90 patients or to receive conventional management, 90. So 68, 75% of the patients actually received ECMO, and 63 of the patients were allocated to consideration for the treatment by ECMO and survived to six months without disability compared to 47 of those allocated to conventional management. So these are the results. Sorry for the slide, it's kind of small. So the patients that receive ECMO, they did 63% survive versus 41, 47% did not survive in the conventional group. Died at six months of before discharge, 63% survive and 50% in the other group did. And severe disability was higher on the conventional group than in the ECMO group but the relative risk is not here or the P's are there. But we can see on the table that the patients with ECMO have a survival estimate by a Kaplan-Meier curve higher than the conventional ECMO. So this study, after the study, they recommend transferring of adults with severe but potential reversible respiratory failure the SMIRI score exceeds 3 or half a pH less than 7.20 on an optimum conventional management to a center with an ECMO-based management protocol to significantly improve survival with a severe disability. So most of the patients in this group, they improved without the need of ECMO because they were transferred to bigger centers. But still, this gives us the kind of like the base to think that could ECMO work for all the patients with ARDS? So are we ready to cross the Rubicon River? The Rubicon River was what Julius Caesar crossed when he started the Civil War in Rome. This paint is for Adolf Ibon, 1875, of Caesar. And it's like a really good painting. 
so eolia extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for severe respiratory distress syndrome may 24 2018 so international clinical randomized trial patients with severe rds indicated by one of the three criteria po2 fio2 ratio less than 50 for more than three hours <laughs> po2 fio2 less than 80 for more than six hours are Arterial pH less than 7.25 within P with a PCO2 at least 60 for more than 6 hours. And the primary endpoint was mortality at 60 days. So this is the table of results. In the ECMO group, 44% and the control group, 57%. A primary endpoint mortality at 6 days. So there was no significant p-value 0 0.009. And the mortality is 90 days was 46, 37% to 47% in the control group. So the patients with severe RDS 60-day mortality was not significantly lower with ECMO than with the strategy of conventional mechanical ventilation that include ECMO as rescue therapy. But there was a lot, a lot of, a lot of like controversies, not controversies, I will say like comments in this study because a lot of the patients that were in the control group that were really extremely sick they cross over to the ECMO group, and this caused this variation on the statistic, st uh, statistically significance of the study, because all these patients were sicker crossed to the ECMO group, and affected the results. On the other hand, a lot of people said that if the study will continue longer, it will it will demonstrate a statistically significance. But these are just comments that I had read in the in the journals. So the conclusions for ARDS is rule out ARDS mimickers. Apply the Berlin criteria for definition and diagnosis of ARDS. Net balance fluids if the patient is not in shock, they are not in shock or is not in shock. Use ARDS network ventilator strategies. Assess the driving pressures. Avoid long recruitment techniques. HFOB is harmful for patients with ARDS. Start neuromuscular blockers when indicated. Prompt positions when it's indicated and refer to ECMO in time. Thank you. This is a picture of the islands of the birds in the Gulf of Guayaquil. It's a beautiful island in the middle of the Gulf in the Pacific Ocean. Really, really hot day. Thank you.